We are back. We are back here at the Open Line Radio on KIEE 88.3 FM and also on AOC Community Media. That's Cox 15 and LUS Channel 3 in Lafayette. Please check us out in the five parish area on cable TV. And also, people, we're back live on Facebook. We know Facebook blocked us. You know, hopefully I could consult with the ACLU on that. But no, no, I'm not going to even do that. <laughs> you know, that's another story. That's another oh, story. my goodness. Yeah, it sure is. When Good li- morning. When your live stream get blocked uh, because of the program you're p- producing, not because copyright, in, uh, you know, we've been doing this for years, yeah. because of controversial issues, you know you're doing some 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 good, good thing. Welcome, uh, executive executive director of the Louisiana ACA, ACLU, Sister Attorney Alana Odoms. Welcome back to 88.3. Oh, it's so great to be with you. Good morning, and thank you for having me, and hello to our beautiful audience, and I'm so glad to be back with you. Well, Sister Khadija is not here today, my boss. My uh, oh. taskmaster, she was supposed <laughs> to be here. So I, I was asking, uh, tongue in cheek, can a, a person, a worker, fire their own boss? <laughs> that is a good question. Just quit. I mean, Just quit. Huh? I, I, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not, because I might not have a job in that case. Yes, <laughs> but yes, yes, yes. We, we certainly miss uh, Sister Khadija, and we're going to have to have a really good show mm-hmm. to honor her yes. and make sure that we, we do her proud in her absence. Yes. Uh, well, Attorney Odoms, I, I want to address you properly. Uh, so much is going on. I, we saw you on a local CBS affiliate basically being interviewed about the issue with the Ten Commandments. And I, I know this, this station has a lot of what we call religious and gospel music, and we have a vast yes. audience of, of religious people. And yes. I, I know you could break it down in a yes. sense that our listening audience uh, understand that that's not the same thing of what some of these conservatives are pushing that agenda around the country. And I know I'm putting my take on it right now, but I want to get the take on where the ACLU stands legally based on law uh, concerning the the Ten Commandments. Yeah, so uh, thank you. I appreciate it. And I happen to believe Mm -hmm. uh, exactly what you were saying. So I'll, I'll say it this way. I don't want our listening audience to be confused by this, right? This is not about spirituality. This is not about faith. This is not even necessarily about um, following God's tenets. And I'll tell you why. You have to look at all of the laws that this particular administration has passed. And when you look at those laws and how cruel, how divisive, how discriminatory, and how hateful those laws are, you can really see that posting a picture of the Ten Commandments while you also um, prosecute our children as adults, you take away parole eligibility for people who have served their time in prison, you uh, criminalize abortion and access to other health care uh, in the state of Louisiana for women and for doctors who perform that health care. You, you, you start to see that this is really not about following Jesus's teachings. Mm-hmm. Rather, this is about putting up a specific poster, but it's about informing or trying to to coerce a certain idea, a certain ideology that takes us that takes away many of our fundamental rights. And and specifically, we have a but we have an opportunity. We have a choice in the in this country because of the First Amendment. We can be Baptist, we can be Lutheran, we can be Protestant, we can be Catholic, we can be Jewish, we can be Muslim, we can be Baha'i, we can be anything we want to be. And that's because of the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. And it says you can be whatever you want to be. You will not be persecuted in this country for choosing a specific faith. And if you decide that you don't want to practice a particular religion, you don't have to. So you know how when people say, I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not religious? You can do that in this country, and nobody can mess with you. And so what this law does is it says, you know what? We don't, we want to turn the First Amendment on its head. The First Amendment is not, we don't have that practice in the state of Louisiana. Rather, you have to follow the Ten Commandments. You have to have 
Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have to follow this particular version of the Ten Commandments. And if you don't, we're still going to put it up and we're going to subject your children to to looking at this poster, to viewing this poster, to being uh, in, in, you know, in the environment with this poster, with whatever questions that brings up. And we're going to say, you know what, that is, that's something that we're going to go ahead and do in this, in this state. And that is also importantly, a violation of the fruit of the, of the separation of church and state or the establishment mm -hmm. clause. And the establishment clause of the first amendment says this, the government can't take sides. So the government can't say, listen, we like Christians better than we like Jews, right? Or we like, we can't, the government cannot do that. The government can't say, hey, we're going to teach a particular religion because we believe that this particular religion is better than the others. That is something that the founding fathers thought about from the beginning of this country and knew that if the government did that, that we would have all kinds of, of terrible problems that would result from it. And so they said, no, we are going to have a separation of church and state. We're not going to have a, a, a fundamental or a, um, a national religion. We're not going to require people to follow one particular religious text or one pr particular religious doctrine over another. That's been since the beginning of this country. And so I just want our religious folks to, to really understand and our, our, our communities of faith that it is absolutely beautiful that we have a tradition of faith, especially in the black community. It is so important. And guess what? It is important for us to be able to teach our children about that faith and to make sure that they're not people in schools who are teaching them something different than what we want them to know. And I'll say this, based on what we know about the way that this particular administration has handled our children, not wanting to feed our children in the summertime, again, removing laws that would create protections to treat our children in the juvenile justice system versus sending them to, a, to the adult system. Are these the kind of people that we really want teaching our children about religion or about spirituality? I think not. That's not that that kind of um, message that we're sending is that children are not to be protected. Mm -hmm. Children don't deserve to eat. Children have to spend for themselves. Children are out here on their own. I don't know. I mean, I happen to have a Christian faith, which I think is mm -hmm. is is important because it's a, it's important to my life. It's important to the way I raise my daughter. It's all of these things. But do I want to surrender that and say, hey, the school can teach her whatever they want to teach her about the faith that I've been teaching her? No, that's something that has to be decided by an individual, by that person, by that by that family, by those parents and by those children. And this law really clearly violates all of that. Mm -hmm. and, and you see uh, this these word phrases has been thrown around a lot of uh, what we call uh, and, and, and just me saying this uh for the audience to understand, you hear the words white Christian nationalist. Mm -hmm. That is a term that can be related to a lot of racism and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, bad situation. And is, in your opinion, as a, uh, a, a legal member, a member of the court, legal person, is Christian nationalist a right? Uh, you know, in the sense that we have to tolerate something, some some groups that are more uh, prone to uh, engage in racism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it's important to know. I'm glad you asked about this. That some of the same folks who supported um, this Ten Commandments bill were also the um, folks who asked for the um, criminalization of abortion mm -hmm. who asked and and even with regard to the exemptions if you remember mm -hmm. um, exemptions for rape and incest these are the same groups that said no rape and incest exemptions that we want to um, have a ban on abortion uh, no matter what and then also the same folks who talk about um, you know criminal criminalizing uh, medication that is um, available in all other places in the United States, uh, but saying that in Louisiana, if you if you are in possession of this particular medication, that you can be prosecuted and criminalized. So, yes, we are seeing that it's not 
the 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 religious right or the or white Christian nationalists, it's it's not just simply about putting up the Ten Commandments in the classroom. It's also many other aspects mm -hmm. of um, mm -hmm. law that they essentially are using the religious ideology to to justify depriving mm -hmm. people of rights or even incarcerating people. Right. And so it's a very important aspect to raise, and I'm glad you raised it. And, and the, figure, the fingerprints of Project 2025, and I've said it many times on this show, and, uh, yeah. and I say, well, what this governor and his cohorts, and, and some of them come from my area, we know State Senator Blake Miguez, a lot of our, mm -hmm. our and that's just me, criticism of some of our black po politicians who have lined themselves, and some of them call the show and say, well, you know, uh, they want Project 2025, and uh, those conservatives want to do away with set-aside programs such as Head Start and so forth. But if you still, if you're aligning yourself with people who have an ideology against your community, you, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't understand it. So we see those fingerprints of Project 2025, the agenda to do away with a lot of progressive or, or even common sense uh, things that we have ac uh, become accustomed to. So I don't know if you look at it that way, but I, I see that all of this in Louis State of Louisiana this year was a dry run for Project 2025. I think you're exactly right. Uh, Louisiana was a test ground for Project 2025, and we saw many of those um, ideas around um, removing separation of powers, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, really um, consolidating power in the governor's office, making it so that he is an all-powerful monarch, a king that would be able to make uh, decisions without having the checks of mm -hmm. the legislature or having the checks of the courts. Yes, this is very, very true. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that I think we need to remember, especially around, you know, you know, thinking about all of the changes that have happened, the changes to, to you know, the repeal of all the amazing work that we did with criminal legal reform. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine, we are now in, a, in the state of Louisiana where we were the right. most incarcerated state in the world. Right. And now we have a, a, a governor who has, has eliminated parole eligibility. We have more people in our prison systems and any other place. And now we're saying it doesn't matter mm -hmm. if you have paid your debt. It doesn't matter if you have served your time. It doesn't matter if you've had good behavior. It doesn't matter if you have worked for the state, because as you know, incarcerated people provide uh, a very significant portion of the labor in this state. If you go to the state capitol and you see folks who are in jumpsuits, who are providing, you know, landscaping, sanitation, cooking, culinary, all of those things are all, all of those services are provided by incarcerated people. So we're saying that those people are good enough to work for the state and to, to do free labor for the state of Louisiana, but they're not good enough to be released back to their families and to work and to earn a living for themselves and their families. That is a part of this, right? It's a part right. of going back. And essentially, when Donald Trump talks about making America great again, when he said to those uh, to those folks at his campaign rally, if you vote this time, you won't have to vote again because we'll have it taken care of. That is the ideology of Project 2025. And that is then Louisiana, as I said, as you've said, has been a test ground for that. If 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 Donald Trump becomes president, no one will have to vote anymore because they will <laughs> ensure that elections don't matter. Right. Yeah. That the consolidation of power is the gov. you know, in with the recent Supreme Court case that says right. that the, the president can do whatever he wants yeah. to do, even if it's illegal. And he yeah. has the ability to do that, elevating him to a king status. Yeah. That's essentially what he's saying. If we don't get out and vote this time, if we, we, we won't have an opportunity to vote in the future because the First Amendment doesn't matter to these people. The 14th Amendment, which is the Equal Protection Clause, they certainly don't care about that. They're looking to roll back affirmative action, which has already happened. They're looking to uh, prosecute people who are trying to give opportunities to people of color. Yes. They're looking to pro continue uh, incarcerating black people at higher rates than in any place in the world, not giving people a chance to, to get out. This is a it's a crisis and it's something that we in this state have to pay particular attention to because they say Project 2025, the official national version is go potentially going to go into effect with Donald Trump. But Project 2025 has already happened here in the state of Louisiana. Yeah. yeah. Uh, audience, you're listening to 
the executive director of the Louisiana ACLU, attorney Alana Odom's great to have her bag. Been missing her. Yeah. Uh, before I go up into this and, and uh, close the, the page on this uh, this issue right here, uh, the Ten Commandments, if it proceeds and makes its way through different court jurisdiction, uh, where you see it going to the Supreme Court and based on how the Supreme Court been ruling lately, uh, I mean, mm-hmm. what's your pred- you, do you have do you care to predict anything? <laughs> well, you know, I'm a hopeful person yes. uh, and, you know, I'm also a person of faith. And so I'll say this right now. We're in the federal district court in the middle district, Judge right. DeGravels. And so we have a hearing coming up on September 30th. And we're actually going to be bringing folks to the court uh, for that September 30th hearing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the defendants have filed a, a motion to dismiss our case. Right. Uh, and we will um, we'll be arguing on the merits of that on September 30th. Um, you know, depending on how the federal court rules, we we are pretty sure that the state, the defendants will appeal. And so that appeal mm-hmm. will go to the United States Fifth Circuit. Mm-hmm. And so, it, you know, we have one of the most conservative circuits in the nation, uh, in the Fifth Circuit. And so we'll have to see, of course, how that appeal goes. And, you know, if in fact uh, the federal court, let's say, for example, the federal court uh, overturns this law, right? And then the right. defendants appeal. If the United States Fifth Circuit affirms that decision, we would be taking an appeal up to the United States Supreme Court. Okay. So it, it just depends on how the the, the courts rule, um, uh, and it depends on you know what what's going to happen in the at the appellate phase. Mm-hmm. But it it is possible that this case would be up before the United States Supreme Court, and our hope is that the court rules in accordance with the very um, longstanding precedent of a case called Stone versus Graham, mm-hmm. and that's a 1980s case actually a case in the, uh, of 1980 where the Kentucky uh, school board tried to do exactly the same thing that's happening here uh, with this governor and attorney general. And what the Supreme Court said in that case is that you cannot have the government favor one religion over another and mandating that the Ten Commandments be posted in the classroom was really a violation of that, um, of that tenet of the First Amendment. And that there has n- and it's really important to note and i want to you know make this clear for the audience there has never been a federal court or a court that has um found that posting the 10 commandments in a in a classroom is constitutional there has never been and so all we can say is that you know you never know what is going to happen but you can look to very long standing precedent um you know 1980 i was born in 1981 yeah. so i know what i know how long that precedent yeah. is that's 40 that's 43 years of of uh, 44 <laughs> years of precedent that we would that the the, the supreme court would be going against okay. if they changed Attorney, the law uh, Attorney uh, Odoms, we have uh, Sister Khadija on the line. She's calling in. She's yes. late. Good thing I have a lawyer on the line, a doctor. Uh, welcome, Sister Khadija. Yes, good morning. A powerful program. Attorney Odom, I wanted to uh, find, uh, speaking of the Ten Commandments, uh, Louisiana governor, uh, he just took away millions of dollars from the homeless. And some, yep. somewhere in those uh, Ten Commandments, you're supposed to be able to help feed uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the homeless. Uh, taking good time away from so many uh, deserve so many deserving inmates. That's that's like a death sentence because they work faithfully uh, to make sure that their their good time is not in jeopardy of anything. Oh, uh, I'm just I wanted to find out uh, what we just have to like. Continue to let the taxpayers' money fight against uh, this uh, Louisiana governor, uh, who himself had uh, I don't want to I don't want to call the our other people, uh, but our some of our immigrants, you know, he was paying them uh, less than minimum wage when they were working mm-hmm. on his property. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Thank you for calling, in, Sister Kadija. Hope to see you at uh, it's the always, station. It's always good to hear your voice, Sister Khadija. And, and as always, you always bring the facts. You always are able to kind of give us the real truth of what is happening. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she's absolutely right. Yes, 
if we if we, <laughs> let's just say this mm-hmm. you know you ever been uh and you met somebody who um they call themselves a christian mm-hmm. they can cite you you know scriptures from from chapter and verse from memory but you see in terms of the way that person treats other people the way that person conducts themselves that there's some inconsistency between what they say about themselves and what they actually do and how they conduct themselves. And I think Sister Khadijah really, she really hit the nail on the head. You can talk about posting the Ten Commandments all you want, but if at the end of the day you promulgate laws that discriminate against black people, poor people, Immigrants, if you make it more likely that those people will not have a chance to survive and live, if you take aim at children and you call them the worst of the worst, if they are throwaways, if they're not worth investing in, they're not worth feeding, what kind of what kind of religion is that? Right. What kind of what kind of faith practice is that? I don't care what faith you have, if you are in fact living those spiritual principles, you believe in some very core ideas. You believe in empathy. You Mm -hmm. believe in grace. You believe in compassion. You believe in dignity. You believe in second chances. You believe in kindness. You believe in working together and collaborating. You believe in sharing. (laughs) These are all basic things, but that is not what's happening in the state of Louisiana. As a matter of fact, the opposite is happening and the power is being wielded in a way that continues to harm communities that have been the most vulnerable Mm -hmm. from the very beginning, right? Looking back to our history of slavery, looking back to our history of Jim Crow segregation and the ways in which things like police violence continue to harm Mm -hmm. our communities, housing insecurity, food insecurity, lack of access to fair housing, lack of access to the ballot, continued racial gerrymandering. Those are the kinds of things, if you really wanted to be focused on um, being a faith, you know, a faith driven person, you would be concerned about eliminating all of the disparity that I just talked about. Yeah. That would be the primary goal mm-hmm. of your administration if you were truly practicing Jesus's teachings. That, and that's what I want to ask you about. You, uh, I want to roll into the issue, uh, the, the new law. One, uh, I, I don't know if it's that one law or several laws concerning voting, uh, absentee voting and uh, my mother is a 93-year-old uh, t- uh, person in the, in the home, and I normally helped her with her ballot. And it and yes. I start reading the new law, and it, it's almost like a scary situation. You make the wrong move, your vote might not get counted. You may, I mean, you you process yep. the the ballot wrong, and yep. she already had a couple of ballots sent back to her. Uh, I was help I was helping to fill it out last year. Now the thing is, they they before. The proof positive that if you have an elderly person, a person, an informed mm-hmm. person who's homebound, they would take that uh, into consideration. So say, well, don't worry about it. Uh, you know, I talked to the clerk office. Now you have the new laws on the book that are make it almost like you're scared to engage in mm-hmm. helping somebody vote. You know, what, what that, is that all about, uh, Attorney? I want to share with you that you know, before the passage of the Voting Rights Act, which mm-hmm. ensured that we could vote without fear of being mm-hmm. um, beaten, without fear of being targeted for violence, as as you know, all across the American South, mm-hmm. there were efforts to prevent us from voting. And some of those mm-hmm. tactics looked like poll taxes, which means mm-hmm. you had to pay more if you wanted to vote. They look like literacy tests, which means right. let's just let's test you on some very um you know, um, very esoteric, different facts that nobody would probably know. Most people wouldn't know. But if you don't know how to answer these questions in this particular test, right. you're going to um, you won't be able to vote. And so, you know, every time we look at voter um, suppression tactics, we have to remember that this is how this is what the country was founded upon, mm-hmm. trying to prevent formerly enslaved people from voting and from organizing themselves together politically in the American South. Right. That is, it's, that is the history that we're facing. So every single time there are restrictions to voter access, it's an, it's an evolution of, this, um, of these tactics that began 
essentially after uh, after slavery, right? All of these different tactics to say, okay, you might be free, but we don't want you to be involved in the political process, right? right? We don't want you, and we're going to make sure that you're not, because if you are involved, right, Louisiana's population is 33 and a third percent African American. Right. If we are involved and politically active and politically strong, we have a very, very influential political force in this state. And so the, there's always going to be these efforts um, to to suppress our vote. And so here, though, I really want to make sure, as far as I understand this new law, is that you can still continue to witness your absentee ballots for your for your immediate immediate family members so your right. elderly mother would be fine anybody living in your house people who are in your family you can still absolutely absolutely do that mm -hmm. and that i don't want folks to be afraid to continue to help their family members and elderly folks and folks that you know are in your family right. you should continue to do that that is permitted uh, by the law the, 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 the other change is around uh, voter registration and voter mobilization, voter voter mm -hmm. registration drives, that those things have to be registered right. um, with the Secretary of State. Now, here's the here's the thing. I don't know. And they have not identified what the penalties are for failure to do this, failure to register. Um, but I would just wholly encourage that if you are doing voter registration, that you do fill out this paperwork and that you ensure that folks are not purged from the rolls. Because what I would imagine, what I know, our traditional voter suppression mm -hmm. tactics is purging people from the rolls is very common, right? right? You know, changing polling locations, changing places where people traditionally vote and not telling you about where the new location is very common. Those are all kind of evolutions of this, these original kind of voter suppression tactics that I just explained to you. And so in order for us not to have those kinds of things, let's make sure that we are following as best we can these particular laws. And then also, frankly, those nonprofit organizations and other advocacy organizations that are working to protect people's access to the ballot need to be challenging some of these laws because it is it is truly violative mm -hmm. of uh, the Voting Rights Act. And, you know, these are clearly voter suppression tactics, purging people from the rolls, closing polling locations, um, um, limiting people's access to the ballot. These are things that, you know, and I always think of this. I'm like, why would you want to limit people's access to the ballot? Why would you mm -hmm. not just want everybody to have the same access, everybody be able to vote, and you simply just have, you have the better candidate, you have the better platform, you have the better services to offer to people, and so people get to vote for that. But that's not what they want. Their strategy is voter suppression, mm -hmm. right? Their strategy is, nope, we don't want you to have access to the ballot because we know that if you actually vote your conscience, you vote for the candidates that protect your interests, that we wouldn't have Governor Jeff Landry. And that's the truth. Right. And um, uh, as I go into this next segment, uh, and, and, and not to keep you uh, all day, but I, I want to touch briefly on your opinion or, or your take as a uh, member of a, the foremost civil rights group fighting for justice. The, the shooting with our sister out there in Illinois, Sonia Massey, oh. was troubling and yes. left me troubled watching the video. Uh, if you care to talk about that and also uh, the work you guys are putting in. The, I tell everybody, go to the ACLU of Louisiana website because I also sign up for their newsletter. Look at all the work they've been doing with uh, these issues with policing. So uh, I just want to let yes. people know that. But uh, let's, let's go jump into that. Uh, I'm so Sonia happy that... Massey. Yeah, I'm so happy that you asked me about this. So, you know, every couple of months, we have another mm -hmm. tragic, tragic story of a black man, black woman, black child. Uh, and frankly, there are other, you know, other groups mm -hmm. that have experienced that experience police violence at a very high rate as well. But losing losing our life as a result of excessive force and police violence 
And this goes back again. I always like to connect our mm-hmm. work that we're doing specifically at the ACLU and through our justice lab, which is our police accountability program. Mm-hmm. I always like to connect it back to history, right? Mm-hmm. The history of policing in this country started as a result of um, what are called slave patrols, which were these citizen groups, mostly white citizen groups that formed to be able to hunt down um people who were trying to escape from slavery or to re uh, to recapture people who were freed from slavery. And this was, um, you know, these slave patrols were very much like, if you really go and look at that history, a lot of these special task forces that these, you know, that police units have, like you think about whatever that one, the task force that was formed in Baton Rouge that was doing all of those terrible things to people in that brave cave, those, all of that terrible abuse, um, those kinds of the slave patrol is very similar to what modern day policing is today. And, you know, we see the violence continue, right? Mm -hmm. We saw with George Floyd's murder that happened during COVID. So a lot of people were home. uh, They were watching that video over and over again, but this, this continues to happen every single day in, in our country. And Sonia Massey's murder is a, is a, is a, very, very clear example that violations of the fundamental civil rights of black people in this country by police is an epidemic. Just like we had uh, the pandemic, we have a pandemic of police violence across this nation. And so let me talk a little bit about the work that we do at the ACLU. We have a police accountability program where we have sued over 250 police agencies in our state. We do this because we want to stop the stops. How many of these encounters happen is that either police are called to a scene to help a black person as they were called to Miss Massey's home uh, because she was experiencing a mental health crisis. And instead of providing help, they provide harm and they they hurt people, shoot people, kill people. Um, And then the other way that it happens very often is that police are stopping people for traffic stops or other racially profiling uh, different communities, traditionally black people, black women, black men, black children, also members of our immigrant community. And in those stops, those interactions with police get escalated uh, traditionally uh, by the police, and then they end in some kind of terrible um, violence happening and and terrible, terrible outcomes for the family. So um, over the course of the last uh, almost five years, uh, we sued over 250 police agencies, and we have also brought about 60 cases on behalf of Black people who've had their rights violated by police. So this is everything from racial profiling to excessive force to harassment to surveillance, um, driving while Black, walking while Black, uh, living while Black, all of these things that happen to um, members of our community. We have stood up in federal court and we have filed Section 1983 cases, which basically means we are saying that the government has violated the civil and constitutional rights of people exactly. by the actions of police who are exercising excessive force, racial profiling, and other things. Um, really importantly, we have brought almost a dozen cases against the Louisiana State Police. And we've also brought in the Department of Justice to do the pattern or practice investigation that they've been doing specifically around excessive force and uh, racial profiling. That investigation is still ongoing and the Department of Justice is still doing the work of investigating the Louisiana State Police. And that's a really important thing because the Louisiana State Police don't just respond to their own cases. Mm -hmm. The Louisiana State Police are also brought in on on many, many cases that happen in individual parishes to review, for example, body camera footage. If a police officer um, exercises excessive force and they need to be investigated, they bring in the Louisiana State Police to do that. So if if you have uh, an agency that is rife with its own constitutional problems, you cannot have that agency be the one who's investigating our other um, individual parish uh, agencies. So it's really important that we find uh, ways to hold police accountable. And through our litigation, I wanna say this, we have taken on cases where 
people would not have otherwise had representation. We've taken on cases of people who are homeless, who've been violated by the police, young men and women who um, have been um, harassed by the police, beaten by the police, have had guns drawn on them, college students who were just simply, um, you know, driving, who've been, you know, attacked by the police. All these kinds of cases that otherwise would not have had representation, we take on these cases. And over the course of the almost five years that we've been doing this work, we have secured almost $800,000 in settlements for our clients. And that is something that we never thought would have been possible because the law is so horrible with regard to qualified immunity. But we have challenged qualified immunity in almost uh, and won in almost a, uh, 10 of our cases. And, and that is something that's shocking. We never, ever thought that we would be able to change um, and have favorable rulings on qualified mm-hmm. immunity, but we've done that through our program and we've been very, very successful. The other thing I wanna note is that the statute of limitations, before we started doing this work um, in, in um, let's see, we started in two, 20, uh, 2018, 2019, the statute of limitations was one year for Section 1983 cases. The statute of limitations was recently changed in the legislature to be two years. That means that if you have had an interaction with police where your rights have been violated, where racial profiling, excessive force, harassment, surveillance, beatings, whatever it is, you now have two years to file your Section 1983 action instead of one year. And that Mm -hmm. means so much to people because they're also traditionally usually fighting some other criminal charges that come from that interaction, right? So if the police violate your constitutional rights, you usually also have some other kind of charge that would be like resisting an officer, flight from an officer, battery of an officer. If they're beating you, they're likely going to put additional charges on you (laughs) so that you would have to fight those charges. And so what happens is a lot of people spend that first year just trying to fight the criminal charge, right? They don't even have time to think about their constitutional rights. So an additional year to be able to file your civil rights challenge is really important to helping people um, get, you know, get a remedy in court for this for this behavior. And so it's the, the work of our police accountability work is the most important work that we do at the ACLU. And we have dedicated ourselves and all of our attorneys we do this work every single day. We work with 50 law firms from around the country who provide us pro bono uh, support wow. to, to, to take these cases to court. We work with 19 legal clinics, and we also work with corporate partners who help us do our intake. So we have marshaled the resources of hundreds of attorneys to come into this state to say that we have a pandemic of police violence and that we believe that we have to fight these cases in court. We have to tell the stories of, of people, mm. especially like our sister Sonia Massey and oh, many yeah, people, for Sonia example, Massey. who are experiencing this kind of violence in Jefferson Parish, in Lafayette, in Opelousas, yes. in, in, in Shreveport, in mm-hmm. Caddo, all New over Iberia. in St. In Tammany, in Covington, New Iberia, exactly. This is happening all over our state, and we are one. We believe that if we don't focus on protecting people from police violence, how are you going to have people who are going to be able to and, vote if and, they're constantly being beaten by the police? And Sister Alana, we- and Sister Alana, I recently just saw this case uh, on the local affiliate. I just want to just comment on briefly because it's it, it's just as egregious as. Sister Sonia Massey, where there was a police action on a house in Lafayette uh, through the Lafayette PD officers, where they went in uh, with guns a blazing, and what happened wound up was a, a infant, a beautiful young, black, very young black female got killed, and I saw the mother was on Baby. local TV pleading for some help on that we don't know the outcome of what would happen that's recent uh, recently right and we invited her to come on the show and talk about it but when officers don't when the police department don't engage in transparency so the, the issue at hand was the body camera footage uh to show who probably shot the young lady i mean the young child and that's the issue of transparency uh does that those new laws that Governor Landry and Blake Miguez, and I'm going to say his name because he's from my area, push the Louisiana legislators to enact. Does that, those new laws protect law enforcement jurisdiction from turning over body cam footage? 
or is 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 it much more complicated than that? You know, it shouldn't. They, the the law enforcement should still have the obligation to turn over uh, body camera footage, and like that is something that we've had a lot of trouble with. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes being able to obtain that footage, and but it's something that. If you think about how to, what what would be the point of having of re requiring body cameras mm -hmm. and requiring that officers turn those body cameras on so that we have an opportunity to observe what really occurred and then to allow police agencies to um, hold on to that coverage, you know, hold on to that data, hold on to those videos, and not be able to share. Yeah, that. I mean, think about. Yeah, Think yeah. about, I mean, we all know the, the terrible story of Ronald Green and how right. the news media had to leak that footage, right? Would we have ever had, um, yeah, you know, I, yeah. and we still don't have justice for the for Ronald Green and yes. Ronald Green's family, but yes. would we have ever known the true story of that if the if the Associated Press didn't leak that video footage? Correct. The poli the Louisiana State Police were not going to turn that footage over. They had it for two years, and they said they did not have anything. They said they did not know this man died in a car crash, and we had no idea, and that was not true. Sister Khadija's so, back, back in the studios. Uh, I well, could, I, hey, brother James. My boss is uh, on fire today. Yeah, uh, yes, indeed. I could make my own announcements. Yes, and uh, I wanted to. I wanted to uh, uh, piggyback on what you had mentioned about if we doing something with. Uh, we got to sign up if we want to do something with voter registration. Like if I'm at my uh, family reunion and I know. I, I have res uh, family members that has not voted, and I have voters registration forms. You mean to tell me I have to call somebody to tell them I'm, I'm at a family reunion and I'm going to uh, get uh, some people to sign up that I know haven't voted. I got to get permission to do this, something that I'm doing, but out of the kindness of my heart, I got to get permission to do this from them? No. So I, I think, you know, okay. we have really yet to see how this is going to be enforced. Mm -hmm. But I really I do believe that, you know, allowing people to work with their families, even if it is extended families, for example, in the context of a family reunion and, and, and getting people, um, you know, enrolled to, you know, I I do not think that that is violative of this law. But again, if you are doing, for example, a voter uh, voter registration drive, those kinds of things, it appears to me that, that the law requires voter registration drives. For example, if you were going to host one at your church, if you were going to host one uh, oh. through another community organization or through a nonprofit or something like that. A family gathering it is still a family gathering to me and helping people um to vote in, in, that, in that particular context is not, in, in my opinion, is not a voter registration drive. Um, but again, I think it's really important that we, you know, we realize that we're in a we're we're in a really challenging time, and it, we just have to be as careful as possible. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, yes, ma'am. And uh, dealing with the 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 ten the ten commandments. Yeah, she, she went over that. Yeah, I, I, I knew I was listening. And uh, dealing with the Ten Commandments, uh, it would have been better spent, better uh, at these locals, uh, municipalities are in Congress and the House of Representatives. I mean, we have people uh, stealing uh, millions of dollars all the time. So uh, one of the commandments say do not do not steal but you know they <laughs> still in all, all the time well it's, it's subjective yeah you know why it's subjective uh and and stuff like that because uh, i i attended a um a hearing and uh judge hike uh he testified on behalf of the young man former judge, judge hike he testified on behalf of the young man the young man had stole one million seven hundred and something thousand of dollars from Aetna uh, insurance company and uh, Judge Hike, you know, he shed a couple of tears saying that the young man had a problem, you know, uh, and uh, uh, with drugs, which a lot of our family members uh, do. But the judge gave him gave him uh, 18 months in a federal prison for stealing mm -hmm. one million six hundred and seventy something thousand of dollars uh, and and that just happened mm -hmm. in january so right now he's off to a halfway house and so 
that's kind of like the total hypocrisy that we continuously see. And that's what would, would be where the uh, Ten Commandments should be at. <laughs> well, that's, that's. Exactly. Sister Khadija, you're exactly right. <laughs> you talk about, you know, you look at the Ten Commandments and it says, you should not, thou shalt not kill. But this is the same administration yeah. that just brought back the death penalty right. and brought back all of these terrible ways of executing people. It's totally hypocritical. It's, it's hypocrisy. And it's uh, something that we have to make sure that we recognize the inconsistencies that are here. We recognize that this is propaganda, that they are trying to mm -hmm. talk about religion and talk about faith and all these different things. But at the same time, they are taking our communities and our families and our children and treating us as if we are second class citizens and that is not that's not okay. Yes, and uh, and and also I'm 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 not exactly sure if you had heard about the look the case with our 11 year old child uh that is in in, in incarcerated uh, uh as as we speak the uh, the her attorney that she had before uh and I don't have a problem with telling you who he is but uh Another attorney has taken the case and she's requesting that uh, lawyers to try to help her out because there's so much that has was done uh, wrong or you could say they did it right because like they got the results. But you have the you have the mother uh, that's in, that's incarcerated. Uh, and the and you have the the father who was in court at that particular time with the young girl, uh, but you know when you have a uh, mental uh, illness, it don't matter where you where you put me at, and and to to send that little send that little girl, uh, it was Judge Roger Hamilton Jr. to give the, that little girl that type of sentence, whereas a murder was committed. Uh, she has to testify against her brother, against this older, against 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 her brother, and it's like, what what else happening? There's no way the little girl gonna say somebody did something to her or he got caught doing something to her, and everything is is sealed. Have you heard yes. of that case? I remember that case. I remember we actually discussed the case. I think one one of the last times that I was here, right. and I remember saying, you know, whenever I think about children who are incarcerated i think about the work of the equal justice initiative and i think about our brother brian stevenson who has been leading that work for i guess almost two you know two decades now and um you know the united states is one of the only countries in the world that locks up children and that uh, locks up children as young i mean 11 years old is um it's just unconscionable mm -hmm. unthinkable i mean my daughter turns 10 in a couple of weeks and it is, it, you know, she's a baby and this, this child is also a baby. And um, it's just, it's unbelievable to think that we have a nation that is so cruel to children and that she treats children with such reckless disregard and, and, and violates uh, children's rights in this way. And um, it, it's really something that, um, you know, again, when you look at our system of incarceration, when you look at how um, how brutal it is, how um, how it treats people in terms of um, you know locking children up and especially children who have already experienced a, a lot of trauma, a lot of harm, not providing those children with mental health support because obviously that is absolutely what they need. They need trauma counseling. They need mental health support. They need to be in a, in a therapeutic environment that can help address some of these major concerns. But instead, we just have these very, very, um, these very harsh practices that that really treat our children with no love and no support. And, you know, it's it's really shocking and it's really terrible. And, and I think, you know, we worked on the case um, of the children who were placed in Angola. You know, we filed oh, yes. that lawsuit uh, that, against that the Department good. of Corrections. And yeah, it, it, but I'll tell you what, you know, even though we were successful, it, quote unquote, successful in that case of having those children removed from Angola, what we learned while we filed that case, when we got the discovery in that case, is that children are just being warehoused in these facilities. It's not just Angola. Even some of these other facilities, it's all over the place. They're not getting an education. 
they're not getting access to their mental health care. They're not getting their medications. They're not getting the support that they need in, in an incarcerated setting because no matter how much you want to try and dress it up and say that we give services in jail, jails are jails, right? They are not schools. They're not mental health care facilities. They're not therapeutic environments for children. They are jails. And jails are not the appropriate place for children to period. be in. But they're certainly, exactly, but they're certainly not places for, for young children to be in because these children have not even reached the age of, of brain development. They yes. are, their brains are still developing. They are still not of a, a sound mind. A child who is 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, frankly, the new, the new research on brain development says that children are not fully developed right. in terms of their brain matter, gray mm -hmm. matter white matter until the age of 25. So, yes. Yes. And, yes. And so this, yes. And one, uh, I think uh, one major issue that we, we forgot to mention is that uh, had, had the young girl, the young 11 year old been uh, a white little girl that uh, this wouldn't have gone uh, uh, that far. When you look at uh, Dr. Falterman from Iberia Parish, uh, his grandson uh, uh, stabbed his brother. his brother, killing him, killing him mm -hmm. at the age of 14. Now, when um, Chad Hazelwood Jr. Uh, uh, came in and started doing the, the invest, the detective started doing the investigation, he said, just a father, I mean, he said accidental, accidental homicide, which was a big difference big disparity in the uh sentences or the way uh people are prosecuted as as it relates to race in iberia parish very very big disparity and that disparity is not just in iberia parish it's across the whole state yes. and across the whole yes. country well a anything else you want to add i know you've been here a good while and we glad sister khadija we glad to have her back and I, and I told her hopefully we could always get her back. Well, I, I didn't Absolutely. know. I didn't know you had left. I know I could call you and ask you a question anytime. It's just brother Jay can't call nobody in the Yeah, Facebook yes, is, Facebook you can is blocking call. me everywhere. Mm -hmm. Brother Jay, you are always yes, you can always call <laughs> Sister Khadija. I'm always happy to be with you all. I really love. I really love being able to speak to our mm -hmm. community. I really love mm -hmm. being able to share time and information with you all. Please have me back anytime. And um, if this is this is what I want to say is I want to leave people mm -hmm. with a message of hope. Of hope. One of the most important things, Brian Stevenson says that hope is the enemy of injustice. Mm -hmm. We have to jealously guard our hope. And we have to keep our feet moving in the direction of the of the freedom and the liberty that we want. We cannot sit back. We cannot be apathetic. We cannot. Um, we cannot even just remain angry, right? Because mm -hmm. if we, you, if, if our anger creates apathy, then that is going to continue to. Um, it's going to continue to mm -hmm. allow these laws, allow these these folks who are in power, um, to continue to promulgate these laws. We have to remain hopeful, but we also have to get engaged and we have to stay active and be aware. And so that's why I'm so grateful for this show because you all do that. You keep the community informed, you stay informed, and you also talk about the rights of people who otherwise would not have, you know, would not be able to, to, to engage on this platform. So I just want to thank you for the work that you do and say, keep it up. And you have a partner here at the ACLU of Louisiana. So uh, in closing, I know you're closing, uh, you're, uh, on, on behalf of the assassination of Sonia Massey, you're saying that, I mean, or are you saying uh should people like think twice about calling the police or should we still <laughs> call the police and just let them know that we have a camera that's recording their move when they're uh, in the home? Well, she already, she had said, oh, don't hurt me initially, you know? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I know. So that's so painful. It's a, it's such, it's such a difficult, it's such a difficult and challenging thing. She's, we know that the police are supposed to protect and serve. We know that when we call police, like we are hoping that they're going to be protecting us from violence, not subjecting us to violence. And so I would say, you know, 
if you are if you are experiencing um, a situation where you need help, yes, you still do need to call the police because it's something that you should not suffer alone and try to, um, you know, try to do things on your own. But I'll but I will also say this: if you you know, and this is very very. Um, this might be very controversial to say, but if you have a, a child or a family member who's experiencing a mental health crisis, I would not call the police for yes. that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because Too many. I don't, I don't think the police have the training or the um, caring, the, the technical training and the caring that is needed to work with that person. I would try and take that person to a hospital. Um, I would try and get that person some support through mental health. I, obviously, we don't have nearly as enough, enough mental health counselors and enough mental health support in the community. But my first, my first goal with regard to somebody who's experiencing a mental health crisis would be to get them into a healthcare setting. And the police, I think it would be very, it's very challenging uh, for the police to be able to know how to de-escalate a situation, a mental health situation. And I think healthcare providers have a better um, idea of how to do that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, yes, uh, Attorney Autumns. And hopefully uh, people go to, to the uh, ACLU of Louisiana website. <coughs> Check out the first thing. Check out the Justice Lab. See all the great work uh, yes. they've been doing. Yes, thank you. And we and we have a, a local channel, uh, a TV local channel that we would love for you to come on uh, at AOC. Uh, and uh, I know you would enjoy. We have a good program that's going to be on this coming Friday. Vantage View with Dr. Velva Blue, uh, Dr. Velva Bowles, and myself. And I'm gonna try to uh, send you to, uh, the link, Brother G. You can yes. send that would be. Go ahead. Sure, Go ahead. that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All, All right, right, dear. Okay. All right. Y'all have a wonderful day. Thank you. you. Talk to you soon. Yes. yes. Bye. You too. Bye. You too. There you go. You just got through listening to the executive director of the Louisiana ACLU, uh, uh, Attorney Alana Odom.